needs can move into those bungalows, sheltered accommodation, however you want to describe it, then that will that will free up the market elsewhere. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that to your point in terms of housing associations, I can only comment from my own personal experience. They they've been very helpful to us in terms of uh, delivering this piece of work. Two, two questions. One's about page 34 of your report where you talk about the landlord licensing schemes in the city of Egypt. Uh, in, in my view, you know, based on anecdotal evidence rather than full data, uh, these have so far been very successful. And certainly in my own ward, uh, a lot of road landlords have decided to you know, rethink their career path as well. Um, there appears to be an element of conditionality about um, keeping these schemes going. I mean, having time limited is almost, in, is in a way, pointless. Um, and, and we want to have them extended, and obviously it's the intention of the um, city region to get, try and get them extended. But is sufficient thought gone into um, acquiring evidence base genuinely to show that they, they really do work? Because the danger is it, it's just a one-off. And all the people who have retreated from the market because they're expected to provide decent accommodation will reappear at some point in time if we uh, don't get a, uh, an extension of the scheme. The second question I just want to ask about, which is about the sort of subgroup of homeless people who sleep on the streets, have you a figure uh, for the percentage of people in that category who are suffering? either with addiction problems or mental health problems. And I, I've worked that those groups may overlap, but some data would really be useful in terms of understanding that specific aspect of homelessness. So I'll answer the first, the second question first, because, because the answer is no. Uh, the quality of data around homelessness at, at large is, is very poor. Um, the way that those counts are, are, are undertaken is, 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 quite, is quite poor. Uh, it's essentially someone going around with a clipboard on one night a year. So given that, having the quality of data and the granularity of data that you, that you seek, which we would really like, is very difficult. We haven't got any means, and it's quite difficult under, under data regulations to, to cross-refer the homelessness data that we have, even for Housing First, which is far better quality than, 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 the, than the national data, with any data on, on, on mental health and, 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 uh, and alcoholism, unfortunately, and substance abuse. Uh, yeah, so we, we don't have that. We would like it. Um, online law licensing, um, it, it's, it's good to hear from you uh, some, some evidence of, of it working. That certainly is, is what we hear from our colleagues in the councils where it's in place. You are right that it is uh, is time limited and also only of limited geography within the city region. We very much would like that to, to stay in perpetuity and, I, and, and to work with uh, local authorities to extend it where, where there's a, a willingness and a desire to do so. In order for that to happen, we need enabling powers from government. We are not at the moment because there's a burden period, but have been in conversations about, about further devolution of powers, which the mayor mentioned, that falls under my ambit and this very much is on the table for us. To your points about evidence, they remain sceptical, again, because they're not here, they haven't seen it work. Um, we are building an evidence base on what we want in terms of devolution from everything from the 200 million for Brownfield that the Mayor mentioned earlier through to this. Uh, and I'd be really happy for my team to, to work with you and your colleagues in Sefton and indeed colleagues at Liverpool Council too, to try and draw some of that together. We have some, but it's anecdotal and, and you, you quite rightly say that we could do with making sure it's a bit more thorough. Thanks, Sir. Um, a couple of questions. So, um, Steve talked about um, wanting to persuade local authorities to, to build on ground build sites, um, but for me, it's not about persuasion. It's about the power and the means to do that. Um, he also mentioned that um, local authorities don't have the money often to build houses. So, I'm interested to know if any of the 200 million. Is also going to go towards house building, or if that is exclusively just for the decontamination piece, or um, if there is funding from any other source. Um, and the second question that I've got is with regards to the further devolution of powers that you mentioned. So, um, is there any way for us to guarantee that the decontaminated brownfield 
sites will be given to local authorities as a priority instead of just being taken up by private developers because I know that certainly in Sefton at the moment we are just at the behest of the national um, planning framework and we have no power to, to argue the private developments that are a little power, um, to argue with the, um, the private developments that are taking place on the front. Thank you. Um, so I think the answer to your second question is, is it depends, and it depends essentially on what happens on December the 12th. I would anticipate from where we are, where we have been at the moment, uh, that it seems unlikely that we'd be given those powers to devolution. Um, we can ask for them, and, and we will ask for them. Uh, whether they'll be uh, bestowed on us is, is another question entirely. And I don't, I don't want to cop out, but um, the answer to your first question is, is not dissimilar. Um, so at the moment, the way the way that Homes England, so that's the National House, House Building uh, Funding uh, Organisation works, the way that their funding uh, pots are set up is such that it, it has to focus on infrastructure, it has to focus on decon decontamination and enabling works. There's very little money available to, to build the actual houses except from uh, an innovation point of view. There are means by which you can do it, but it's much easier to get the money for decontamination. That's not to say that we can't and won't and the conversations that we're having with them, they're actually based in this in this office now, are really positive about how we can work together to deliver on a, a pipeline of schemes and priorities and to bring together funding as best as we can. What we might be able to do is, as an organisation, with our own sources of funding, stand behind some of the enabling works and help support delivery of the housing ourselves. That's something that we can and we will and have considered. Um, but it's early stages in terms of that for us. So Marshall. Thanks, Jay. John, I, I think this is a really great document. I think the fact that we've been able to pull it together with the private um, private landlords and the sorry, private companies and the social providers and the local authorities as they seem to be met in March and have the, the workshops. I think it's great. It's got all the priorities in them, obviously. Through and um, loving the future proofing and the disability by design elements, which I know you haven't been able to sort of screw down as such, but certainly as much of the energy efficiency stuff. But the fact that it's on there, and as you say, the design champion put in place by Steve um, is great. Picking up both on Edna's and on um, Christine's entry, Edna's frustration with the provision of bungalows that um, was certainly mentioned at the workshop. Um, and that this, I remember reading the Liverpool City Council. frustration uh, uh, first and foremost that, that, that we're seven years on and, and we're repeating the same conversations and, and certainly Tim who's my lead officer for housing has been, has been working on this for a long long time and so he knows right it's, it's perhaps one of the reasons why why this is so good and so tight thank you very much for those for those comments I'll make sure I reflect them back to the team uh, the question of of uh, council housing and prioritization it is a difficult one um, you know, for us, we recognise that there's a desire on the political network to, to push that forward, and, and you, you heard a, a pretty strong commitment from the mayor this morning. Um, what I would say is that that is a political decision. So, if you want to work with your colleagues in the local authorities, the members of the combined authority, to, to, to push that, then you know we're open-minded to it. I think for us, the the ambition is to deliver the forty-two thousand homes uh, come hell or high water. And if there, if there are means to do that that help support um, 
better social outcomes, uh, better quality, better livelihoods for some of the people in the city region, to use the, the phrase I'm sure you've heard from Steve before, improving the life chances of our citizens, then we should be open-minded about all of them, and it's clear that there is a, a pretty strong and compelling case for council houses to be part of that mix. Any more questions? I'll uh, use my chair's prerogative again and ask a couple myself. Um, one thing that is mentioned in the report quite briefly is um, trying to integrate, it, integrate housing policy with public transport, which is obviously something I would um, I'd like to see a lot of. I also think we need to be looking at whether we need to be making as much provision for private car ownership, because at the moment, I know in Liverpool we have uh, a standard of 1.5 parking spaces per house, roughly, which kind of builds in ownership of cars for, for the lifetime of that house. Now, um, we should be trying to encourage people to try and choose living without a car if possible, and integrating with public transport probably could be part of that. It has a knock-on benefit, meaning we could have uh, denser developments without space given over to uh, surface level car parking, which would mean that would put less pressure on the land that is available. So I was just wondering if that has been considered in any way as part of the um, housing statement. And the other thing I'd like to pick up on is you talked a bit about retrofitting. Um, I understand you, you know, said it's not currently fundable to go to every single house and insulate them from top to bottom. I understand that. I wonder if, is it possible? Is it something that could be looked at? Could the combined authority put together packages uh, uh, of projects to try to harness more energy company obligation money? So basically pitching for the money that is available through the legislation, I don't know if that's been looked at by the combined authority at all. Yeah, so I'll take each of your questions in, in order. Uh, the first one uh, is, is a really interesting and, and, and timely point to make. Um, I would say that this, this document it doesn't stand in isolation, it's, it's part of a broader suite of strategic work that we're doing. The first the first document, which was the Combined Authority Transport Plan, which I think was brought to you uh, earlier in the autumn or perhaps in late summer, and the third of which is, is, is what, what the Mayor alluded to, which is our spatial development strategy, which is on a, a, a slightly longer timeline to deliver in, in 2021. I, I hope that, that members will recognise some, some synergies between this work and the work of the Transport Plan. The piece of work that brings those two things together and ties them up, particularly on your front, is, is, the, is the spatial planning work. So that's the, that's the place where we can um, set standards in terms of what we want the future housing offers, offer in the city region to be. This directs traffic in terms of priorities where we might, might want, them to, want these houses to be. In terms of design standards, in terms of the number of car parking spaces, for example, that, that's really a planning question. And from the start, we're focusing very closely on our the quality of the housing, very much from a design perspective and from a, a green economy and, a, and a meeting our climate change uh, targets perspective. So that's something that we will have an open mind on in terms of uh, changing the economy and changing people's choices in terms of public transport provision for sure. Um, to your second question around the energy company obligations, uh, I think that that is a, a straightforward yes. Um, it's something that we are trying to do. Uh, we want to do this uh, as best as we possibly can. As I said, it's not it's not fundable within our within our broader envelope. If there are means and ways by which we can secure funding from from external sources, be they private, public sector, or or other types of obligations, we'll consider them. Uh, they may need to be in the first instance relatively small, uh, but we're open minded. We, we we share an office here with the the Northwest Energy Hub that's funded by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and work very closely with them on how you might change the mix, provide retrofit, provide local heat networks, and so on and so on. Um, making a business case for that is, is something that's, that's in the action plan attached to the statement, and it's something that we're working with, uh, with the Northwest Energy Hub, with colleagues in our investment team, and colleagues in local authorities, and if there are any, any suggestions about who else we may want to work with, then that would be very well heard. Any final questions? In that case, um, can I ask if the recommendations as set out on page 13, paragraph 2.1 of the agenda are approved, please? Thanks, John. 
Next item is the Liverpool City Region Housing First Service Update. This report seeks to provide the committee with an update relating to the progress of <coughs> Housing First Service within the Liverpool City Region. Can I ask John, not Kate Farrell, the strategic, well, I don't know. Can I ask John uh, to take us through the report, please? Thank you again, Chair, and, and apologies again on behalf of Kate, who's uh, he's, uh, been uh, otherwise detained this morning. Um, very much a housing morning for me and indeed for you. Um, again, the Mayor talked about housing first. It's, uh, it's a project that's uh, incredibly close to his heart and something that we're quite proud of as, a, as an organisation. Um, I, I will assume that you have read the report, but I just want to give you the, the edited highlights and I'll answer questions as best as I can. And if I can't, I'll take it away and ask Kate and her team to to come back to you. Um, the headlines for us are that after a long time in preparation and pulling together a strategy, this approach to addressing homelessness is, is beginning to deliver and it's beginning to work. So we have employed 15 staff directly within the CA working very closely with local authority partners to deliver Housing First. They are key workers for the homeless people who have been referred to the service, who are seeking to get people a home and giving them the, the wraparound support that they need, be that uh, in terms of substance abuse support, employability support, support through the criminal justice system. Uh, that's now happening. We've had 94 referrals uh, in the space of two months, which basically means that we're full. We can't take any more people through that system. It's a pilot. The idea is to prove that it works, and the team would say that it is. So we've had as many referrals as we can take in the short term. 13 people have been housed, uh, which is, is very good going. Uh, Steve mentioned Finland at the start there. Uh, our colleagues from Finland who piloted this approach in the first place, this time maybe five years ago, can't believe we've had that many people housed so far. There are 48 people actively considering whether they want to use the scheme. We, we anticipate that the majority of those will go forward. And there are around 11 to 15 people currently waiting for the right home to become available for them. So it's, it's going very well in the right direction. Working relationships with key partners in the city region are extremely positive. Uh, we are having regular dialogue with local authority housing teams who are working closely in terms of the referrals and whether Housing First is the right opportunity for some of the people who are within their housing pipeline. We've got excellent working relationships with local key workers within the NHS to make sure people are getting the support that they need and likewise with uh, charities, third sector organisations and the criminal justice system. So for the state of this period of Housing First, it's going relatively well. Uh, we're really pleased with progress. There's a few things that we need to do in the medium term uh, and in the longer term the first is we want to set up a, a, local, a local social lettings agency that can, can help us get more of the properties through and make them available to some of the people who are currently within our pipeline and that will help us to expand the service to more users. Um, that's what they have over in Finland in the parts of the USA that uh, pilots this approach and indeed in, in Glasgow as well. Uh, Housing First is, uh, is the, now the, the policy approach of the Scottish Government and we're in conversations with a potential provider who are working with them at the moment. Um, because at the, uh, for the time being we basically have two members of staff whose full-time job it is working with housing associations, letting agents and so on to try and find these houses. It's, it's quite a, it's quite a high maintenance piece of work for the time being. Uh, the next piece of work that's in the pipeline is looking at um, strategic housing allocations, which is a co-commission piece of work with local authorities to make sure that things like the property pool are working and working well alongside Housing First to make sure that there's no question about who's, who's uh, hopping over one another, how it's triaged and how we're making sure that we can support as many people as possible to move out of homelessness, be that through Housing First or the other significant means by which your colleagues and local authorities work with these people every single day. And the last thing for us, this is a three year program, so we need to think about sustainability, uh, how we're gonna fund it in the longer term. We have seven million pounds from government, uh, that's funding a, a relatively small number of people over the course of that three years. We think, touch wood, that we'll have proof of concept by the time that that funding period uh, finishes. 
uh, and we're starting to think already about how we would fund that from combined authority funding or elsewhere locally. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, John. Not bad for a substitute presenter there. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, Councillor Fearon. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is, you mentioned about property pool. I find that very hard. Dealing with it is that you could, I could be in Nelsley and I'm in property band A. I go to Liverpool, I'm not in that band. I'm in, so each area has a different band, and I think it's very confusing people who, who need the property and they go and they think they're the top of the brand and they're going to be but when they apply for anywhere they're not in that area and I think that's very confusing I think it does need where if you're in a band A in one area I think you should be a band A in all areas so I think it makes it more confusing with the property pools that's where they went back to this situation and, and maybe very old fashioned but I like the way it worked years ago really but, um, but I find that people get very confused over the property pool issues and, you know, all this housing options. And I think there's too much of different names doing the same thing sometimes. Yeah, we, we agree, which is why, we, why we've uh, paid for and supported this uh, uh, look across the piece, across the six local authority areas, to see if there's some ways that we can streamline and re-budget, thus that, that people are, are, are less confused. Um, fingers crossed, uh, it puts forward some recommendations that we, we can all agree. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're in a, a, a much better working place with colleagues across the local authorities than we were this time uh, 12 months ago, so I, I would be hopeful on that front. Thank you. Councillor Marshall. Thanks, Jim. John, I was just interested if there's any capturing and monitoring of the data as far as this pilot. Um, you mentioned obviously that you're going through letting agents as well as the registered social providers and nominations from council um, sort of property pool. So are we capturing the data of what the actual costs of provision are and then modeling that against what it would be if we'd have been able to balance use um, council housing rates if you like um, so that we've got a, an idea of actually going to those private letting agencies as the case and extra costs? Yeah, we definitely are. Um, that's that's very much uh, the the job of, of one of the housing uh, homelessness strategy teams is to monitor this to make sure that it's being properly evaluated and we can get a, a good sense of, of what what this project is costing what this program is costing and and, and touch wood and fingers crossed make a make a sustainable business case for funding in the future yeah so if 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 the committee and yourself councillor marshall would like more detail on that there's probably some that we can share just that, um, I don't know if you could answer this question, but it's just something that you might have heard rumours about. But could, if we win the election, well, if Labour win the election, um, would we be able to um, bring property pool in house so that the council can manage property pool, not the housing associations? Because I'm a part of the hidden homelessness at the minute, and we're currently on property pool, and it's been a nightmare for me. And different um, RSLs from property pool in a different way. So, one RSL you could get me housed a lot quicker than another one, just depending on who's managing it. But I think if the council are running it themselves, it'll have that, um, it'll, it'll have more fairness. You may know more than me on that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's again, it's something that we can we can have as part of the conversation about what, what types of housing and homelessness powers we might want to <coughs> Uh, seek through further devolution, either as a CA or as local authorities, uh, as and when we have the result of uh, an election on December the 12th. It's very difficult for me to uh, comment on things like that as a uh, as a non-political person during Perda, but nevertheless, I hope that that half answers your question. No questions at all? Councillor Marshall. Thank you, um, I've got one question, although you're, you've pretty much covered everything I, I wanted to know in the presentation, so thanks for that. And it's kind of been touched on by other members, but just in terms of talk about developing a business plan, you've got £7 million over three years. Do you have um, estimates of what you might be able to save in the long term? Because we all know that if we invest in services that solve problems, it saves money in the long term. But for example, could you look at the Finland experience and see what sort of savings they've been able to make? 
Yeah, I mean the business case that, that, that Kate put together when she was working with Crisis for us to, to have this as an approach to homelessness in the first instance does, does do that. Um, and I, I don't have the figures off, off hand or off the top of my head, but they're, they're quite large. Uh, likewise, there's really good uh, assumptions based models that we can pull together based on uh, the experiences in, in uh, north northeast of the United States. Um, the intention is that that's how we're going to model this. This is how we want to model anything we want to do from a devolution point of view. Is from a sort of investment in services, in saves costs, and public services further down the line uh, in a different part of the world. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we can. I can't give you a figure off off the off the top of my head, and uh, but I know that that's how we're working on it. <coughs> Sorry, just if I may, a little follow up on that. Something that I come across which is problematic for local authorities. There's a lot of things that lands under their, um, you know, their, their area of work. It saves money for other services, the NHS for example, which is going to benefit massively and get people off the street. So is there any cross-service working on that sort of thing? I'm going to answer that question with a more general point, if I know. Um, that, that's what we try to do across the piece. That's how we seek to make the case for devolution and seek to make the case for further investment in any in any type of public service. Wherever possible, we try to work with the right partners to make sure that they understand that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's about trying to uh, integrate services and commission services in a way that's smart. Uh, uh, speaking personally, I think sometimes we don't do that well enough. As a general rule of thumb in, in the UK, not just a city region problem, we have improving relationships with the local NHS. This has been a huge, a huge sort of uh, beating ground for us in terms of improving, improving that, that setup. Whether we are going to get to the point where, I, which would be ideal of putting in like a, a joint business case, you know, this would save the NHS money and therefore we, we support it, I don't know. But, it, but from my experience with both Public Health England and the NHS, they're very much minded to support our prevention based approaches to fixing health problems, and this is very much one of those, and there are really good publicly available assumptions as to what the cost savings could be. Aileen, in her presentation last time around local industrial strategy, talked about some of them from an economic and employability point of view. So um, I can't answer the direct point here, but as a generality, that's how we want to try and work and build sort of public service reform case studies uh, here in the organisation. Any final questions at all? In that case, um, can I ask if the recommendations as set out on page 45, paragraph 2.1 of the agenda are approved, please? Thank you, John. The next item is apprenticeships. This report seeks to provide an update on the implementation of the actions agreed following the scrutiny review in 2016-17 and a broader update on the apprenticeship delivery within the city region. Can I ask Rob Tab, policy lead? and skills to take us through the report, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, the report uh, sets out uh, an update for members on uh, apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are important to us within uh, the city region, uh, both, and they contribute much, both economically uh, and socially. Uh, we see them as having an economic impact as being good for businesses. Businesses uh, and employers who employ apprentices have a positive economic benefit and they're also seen as a, as a tool of social mobility as well. It allows uh, people to develop skills uh, and to be able to progress uh, in work. Uh, members of the uh, scrutiny committee undertook uh, a review of apprenticeship delivery in the city region back in 2016-17 uh, and put forward a series of recommendations to the Command Authority. Those were accepted and at Appendix A, you have, uh, appendix a, forgive me, uh, you have an update on the uh, of those. It'd be worth just noting that the timing of that was uh, the timing of that work was uh, that work was done at a specific time, just before a major set of funding and operational reforms were implemented in April uh, 2017. What we're trying to do in section uh, four of the report is give you an impact, uh, give you an assessment of the impact of those uh, reforms. Uh, I have to say that the local city region has been disproportionately negatively affected uh, by the implementation of those reforms. 
along with other areas across the country, such as Sheffield City Region, Tees Valley, uh, and areas of West Midlands, where there is a similar uh, business base. And effectively, what we've seen is areas that don't have an awful lot of large employers has seen um, a reduction in the number of apprentice starts because of the way uh, the, the funding changes. You may please know I won't bore you with how the apprenticeship levy works. Uh, I can answer questions on it um, uh, separately uh, if members would wish, but that is uh, one of the issues. So large employers pay um, uh, a particular uh, levy and then we determine how they, uh, they spend that money. There are some positives though for the city region uh, compared to national uh, performance. Uh, our numbers of 16 to 18 year old um, uh, who start apprentices held up well and actually that proportion has increased uh, over the last couple of years and we've seen a significant increase as well in the proportion of people starting a level 4 plus uh, apprentice, so level 4 being the first level with a degree uh, uh, and above. What we have seen of, of late though is a uh, constriction uh, and a reduction of the funding available for smaller businesses, so businesses and employers who don't pay the apprentice levy, uh, so organisations of less than about 130 uh, staff, the funding for that has been reduced quite significantly uh, and uh, we, we understand there is some late demand within the system, so there are employers uh, who wish to create apprenticeships at the moment who can't access the uh, training funding to be able to do, uh, to do that. What we have been able to do with the margins of that is help some of those uh, employers. So there is a, a facility available for employers who have spare or uncommitted apprentice money to transfer that to uh, other employers. And working with uh, a small, uh, a small but dedicated team of skills brokers, we've managed to secure uh, transfers for over, to fund over 100 uh, apprenticeships from organisations such as uh, Liverpool John Lords University uh, and some of the local NHS organisations as well. So we've been trying to find some more money uh, at, at the margins uh, for this, but it's it's fair to say that there isn't enough money in the system at the moment to allow everybody who wants to create an apprenticeship to be able to do so. It's also having a disproportionate effect in some sectors, uh, not just the change in the funding, but uh, the requirement to spend 20% of the time Training uh, that was always in the contract, always in the uh, funding regulations and conditions, but that's being uh, quite strictly enforced uh, now. So, particular, that's had a particular impact on um, social care. Mm -hmm. you think about domiciliary care uh, providers. Uh, if you previously might have had five apprentices, that effectively means that you've lost one FTE. And recognising how tight margins are within social care uh, at the moment, it's been no surprise to see uh, a reduction um, of apprentices. We have tried to uh, put some actions in place within um, um, the programmes uh, that we've got and uh, section 4.8 of the report sets out uh, what we've done now. We have implemented uh, an apprentice application portal, so that takes uh, all of the vacancies, uh, the apprentice vacancies locally and publishes those on a clear, consistent, easily accessible um, uh, website. Uh, my authority in October agreed to invest £4 million worth of uh, SIF funding towards a skills and apprenticeship brokerage service uh, to help uh, promote apprentices uh, with employers uh, but also to promote them uh, with young people and with families uh, as well. Uh, we've invested funding in the development of new standards, so that's a new curriculum areas, uh, particularly in uh, maritime where those qualifications, so those curriculums have been available, so the Maritime Super Skills project uh, took that through. And we've embedded the creation of apprenticeships within the social value uh, approach. I think members will be aware in the past there's been quite a strong focus on uh, seeking uh, the creation of apprenticeships through construction programs, uh, where you have, you know, usually the rule of thumb is if you've got a million pounds worth of a contract, you should have one apprentice uh, created from that. We're trying to have that on a broader basis. Uh, as well, but also have some different approaches and um, examples like um, uh, Mercy Link, uh, the new Mercy uh, Gateway Bridge, was a really good example of where we saw not just the creation of apprenticeships, but some other uh, work experience, work placement opportunities through that. So it's uh, it's construction has this quite well uh, uh, defined, but we're trying to take some of those uh, approaches.
which is sort of, um, through to other sectors as well. Uh, I should note as well that, that we're not just sitting on a long list of this. This is a live conversation that we have with uh, the officials and the veteran and uh, portfolio leader having with uh, the ministers on the regular basis as well. Uh, and uh, clearly there are some uh, uh, issues that we're uh, raising with them and are under the discussion. Further questions or comments at all? In that case, can I ask if the recommendation as set out on page 51, paragraph 2.1 of the agenda be approved, please? Thank you, Rob. And that is the last item on our agenda, so just a couple of last comments from me. Uh, first of all, just to echo uh, Steve Rodman's words earlier, this is uh, Charles's last meeting. Charles Yankett is moving on to pastures new. I'd like to personally thank him. He's been a great help to me uh, when I was sort of uh, surprised, by surprise became the chair. He's uh, supported me to, to get to grips with the role. He's been a fantastic help. So uh, I think on behalf of all of us, just I'd like to place on record our thanks for his good work. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. If there's nothing further, uh, I'd like to thank everybody who has attended today for attending. And uh, please note that the next meeting of the committee will be held on Wednesday the 15th of January 2020. I know it's a bit early, but our next meeting is not till the new year. So can I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Sorry, that is the first time those words have come out of my mouth, but all the best. <laughs>